Chapter Fifteen of Don O'Hara, The Girl Who Laughed. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leanne Howlett. Don O'Hara, The Girl Who Laughed by Edna Ferber. Chapter Fifteen Farewell to Canops. Consternation has corrugated the brows of the aborigines. Consternation twice confounded had added a wrinkle or two to my collection. We are homeless. That is, we are canopless. We, to whom the canops spelled home. Hair canop, moustache a-quiver, and frau canop, cheek-bones glistening, broke the news to us one evening just a week after the exciting day which so changed Benny's life. Is tut uns sehr sehr leid, Herr Knopf had begun, and before he had finished, protesting German groans mingled with voluble German explanations, the aborigines were stricken down, they clapped pudgy fists to knobby foreheads, they smote their breasts, and made wild gestures with their arms. If my protests were less frenzied than theirs, it was only because my knowledge of German stops at words of six syllables. Out of the chaos of ejaculations and interrogation, the reason for our expulsion at last was made clear. The little German hotel had not been remunerative. Our host and hostess were too hospitable and too polite to state the true reason for this state of affairs. Perhaps rents were too high. Perhaps, thought I, Frau Knopf had been too liberal with the butter and the stewed chicken. Perhaps there had been too many golden Fankuchen with real eggs and milk stirred into them, and with toothsome little islands of ruddy currant jelly on top. Perhaps there had been too much honest, nourishing food, and not enough boarding-house victuals. At any rate, the enterprise would have to be abandoned. It was then that the bare, bright little dining-room, with its queer prints of chin-chucking lieutenants, and its queerer faces, and its German cookery, became very dear to me. I had grown to like Frau Knopf, of the shining cheekbones, and Herr Knopf, of the heavy geniality, a close bond of friendship had sprung up between Frau Nurlanger and me. I would miss her friendly visits and her pretty ways and her sparkling conversation. She and I had held many kimonoed pow-wows, and sometimes, not often, she had given me wonderful glimpses of that which she had left, of Vienna, the opera of the court, the life which had been hers. She talked marvelously well, for she had all the charm and vivacity of the true Viennese. Even the aborigines, bristling pompadours, thick spectacles, terrifying manner and all, became as dear as old friends now that I knew I must lose them. The great high-ceilinged room upstairs had taken on the look of home. The blue-beard closet no longer appalled me. The very purpleness of the purple roses in the rug had grown beautiful in my eyes, because they were part of that little domain which spelled peace and comfort and kindness. How could I live without the stout yellow brocade armchair? Its plethoric curves were balm for my tired bones. Its great lap admitted of sitting with knees crossed, Turk fashion. Its cushioned back stopped just at the point where the head found needed support. Its pudgy arms offered rest for tired elbows. Its yielding bosom was made for tired backs. Given the padded comfort of that stout old chair, a friendly time-tried book between my fingers, a dish of ruddy apples twinkling in the firelight, my mundane soul snuggled in content. And then, too, the book in the making had grown in that room. It had developed from a weak, wobbling uncertainty into a lusty, full-blooded thing that grew and grew until it promised soon to become man-size. Now all this was to be changed, and I knew that I would miss the easy German atmosphere of the place, the kindness they had shown me, the chattering, admiring minna, the taffy-colored dachshund, the aborigines with their ill-smelling pipes and flappy slippers, the Wiener schnitzel, the crush-looking wives and the masterful German husbands, the very darns in the tablecloths and the very nicks in the china. We had a last family gathering in token of our appreciation of Herr and Frau Knopf, and because I had not seen him for almost three weeks, and because the time for his going was drawing so sickeningly near, and because I was quite sure that I had myself in hand, and because he knew the Knopfs and was fond of them, and because... Well, I invited von Gerhard. He came, and I found myself dangerously glad to see him, so that I made my greeting as airy and frivolous as possible. 
Perhaps I overdid the airy business, for von Gerhard looked at me for a long, silent minute, until the nonsense I had been chattering died on my lips, and I found myself staring up at him like a child that is apprehensive of being scolded for some naughtiness. "'Not so much chatter, small one,' he said unsmilingly. "'This pretense, it is not necessary between you and me. So. You are ein bisschen blots, nicht? A little pale? You have not been ill, Don? Ill? Never felt more chipper in my life, I made flippant answer, and I adore these people who are forever telling one how unusually thin or pale or scrawny one is looking. Nah, they are not to be satisfied, these women. If I were to tell you how lovely you look to me tonight, you would draw yourself up with chill dignity and remind me that I am not privileged to say these things to you. So I discreetly mention that you are looking interestingly pale, taking care to keep all tenderness out of my tones, and still you are not pleased. He shrugged despairing shoulders. Can't you strike a happy medium between rudeness and tenderness? After all, I haven't had a glimpse of your blonde beauty for three weeks, and while I don't ask you to whisper sweet nothings, still, after twenty-one days— You have been lonely? If only I thought that those weeks have been as wearisome to you— not lonely exactly, I hurriedly interrupted, but sort of wishing that someone would pat me on the head and tell me that I was a good doggy. You know what I mean. It is so easy to become accustomed to thoughtfulness and devotion, and so dreadfully hard to be happy without it once one has had it. This has been a sort of training for what I may expect when Vienna has swallowed you up. You are still obstinate. These three weeks have not changed you? Ach, Don. Kinchin. But I knew that these were thin spots marked danger in our conversational pond. So, come, said I, I have two new aborigines for you to meet. They are the very shiniest and wildest of all our shiny-faced and wild aborigines, and you should see their trousers and neckties. If you dare to come back from Vienna wearing trousers like these— And is the party in honor of these new aborigines? laughed von Gerhard. You did not explain in your note— Merely you asked me to come, knowing that I cared not if it were a lawn fete or a ball, so long as I might again be with you. We were on our way to the dining-room, where the festivities were to be held. I stopped and turned a look of surprise upon him. "'Don't you know that the Knops are leaving? That I neglect to mention that this is a farewell party for Herr and Frau Knopf? We are losing our home, and we have just one week in which to find another.' "'But where will you go?' And why did you not tell me this before? I haven't an idea where I shall lay my poor old head, in the lap of the gods, probably, for I don't know how I shall find the time to interview landladies and pack my belongings in seven short days. The book will have to suffer for it, just when it was getting along so beautifully, too. There was a dangerous tenderness in von Gerhard's eyes as he said, Again you are a wanderer, eh, small one? that you, with your love of beautiful things and your fastidiousness, should have to live in this way, in these boarding-houses, alone, with not even the comforts that should be yours. Ach, Kenshin, you were not made for that. You were intended for the home, with a husband and kinder, and all that is truly worth while. I swallowed a lump in my throat as I shrugged my shoulders. Pooh! Any woman can have a husband and babies, I retorted wickedly, but mighty few women can write a book. It's a special curse. And you prefer this life, this existence, to the things that I offer you. You would endure these hardships rather than give up the nonsensical views which you entertain toward your— Please, we were not to talk of that. I am enduring no hardships. Since I have lived in this pretty town, I have become a worshipper of the goddess Gemmelklickkeit. Perhaps I shan't find another home as dear to my heart as this has been— but at least I shan't have to sleep on a park bench, and anyone can tell you that park benches have long been the favored resting place of genius. There is Frau Nurlanger beckoning us. Now do stop scowling and smile for the lady. I know you will get on beautifully with the aborigines. He did get on with them so beautifully that in less than half an hour they were swapping stories of Germany, of Austria, of the universities, of student life. Frau Knopf served a late supper at which someone led in singing Auld Lang Syne, although the sounds emanating from the aborigines' end of the table sounded suspiciously like Die Wacht am Rhein. 
Following that, the aborigines rose in mass and roared out their German university songs, banging their glasses on the table when they came to the chorus, until we all caught the spirit of it and banged our glasses like Rathskeller veterans. Then the red-faced and amorous Fritz, he of the absent Lena, announced his intention of entertaining the company. Made bold by an injudicious mixture of Herr Knopf's excellent beer and a wonderful punch which von Gerhardt had concocted, Fritz mounted his chair, placed his pump hand over the spot where he supposed his heart to be, fastened his watery blue eyes upon my surprised and blushing countenance, and sang, Ve, das verscheiden müssen, in an astonishingly beautiful baritone. I dared not look at von Gerhard, for I knew that he was purple with suppressed mirth, so I stared stonily at the sardine sandwich and dill pickle on my plate, and felt myself growing hot and hysterical and cold and tearful by turns. At the end of the last verse I rose hastily, and brought from their hiding-place the gifts which we of Knopf's had purchased as remembrances for Herr and Frau Knopf. I had been delegated to make the presentation speech, so I grasped in one hand the too elaborate pipe that was to make Herr Knopf unhappy, and the too fashionable silk umbrella that was to appall Frau Knopf, and ascended the little platform at the end of the dining-room, and began to speak in what I fondly thought to be fluent and high-sounding German. Immediately the aborigines went off into paroxysms of laughter. They threw back their heads and roared and slapped their thighs and spluttered. It appeared that they thought I was making a humorous speech. At that discovery I cast dignity aside and continued my speech in the language of a German vaudeville comedian with a dash of Weber and Field here and there. With the presentation of the silk umbrella, Frau Knopf burst into tears, groped about helplessly for her apron, realized that it was missing from its accustomed place, and wiped her tears upon her cherished blue silk sleeve in the utter abandon of her sorrow. We drank to the future health and prosperity of our tearful host and hostess, and someone suggested dry mal dry, to which we responded in a manner to make the chin-chucking lieutenant tremble in his frame on the wall. When it was all over, Frau Norlanger beckoned me, and she, Dr. von Gerhard, and I stole out into the hall and stood at the foot of the stairway, discussing our plans for the future and trying to smile as we talked of this plan and that. Frau Nerlanger, in the pretty white gown, was looking haggard and distraught. The ugly husband was still in the dining-room, finishing the beer and punch, of which he had already taken too much. "'A tiny apartment we have taken,' said Frau Nerlanger softly. "'It is better so. Then I shall have a little housework, a little cooking, a little marketing to keep me busy and perhaps happy.' Her hand closed over mine. "'But that shall us not separate,' she pleaded. "'Without you to make me sometimes laugh, what should I then do? "'You will bring her often to our little apartment, not?' "'She went on, turning appealingly to von Gerhard. "'As often as Mrs. Orme will allow me,' he answered. "'Ach, yes, so lonely I shall be. "'You do not know what she has been to me this dawn. "'She is brave for two. "'Always laughing she is. "'And Mary, Nicktvar? Mein klein Soldaten, I call her. Soldaten, eh? mused von Gerhard. Our little soldier. She is well named, and her battles she fights alone, but quite alone. His eyes, as they looked down on me from his great height, had that in them which sent the blood rushing and tingling to my fingertips. I brought my hand to my head in stiff military salute. Inspection satisfactory, sir. He laughed a rueful little laugh. Eminently, Abergans befriedigend. He was very tall and straight and good to look at as he stood there in the hall with the light from the newel post illuminating his features and emphasizing his blondness. Frau Nurlanger's face wore a drawn little look of pain as she gazed at him, and from him to the figure of her husband who had just emerged from the dining room and was making unsteady progress toward us. Herr Nurlanger's face was flushed and his damp dark hair was awry so that one lock straggled limply down over his forehead. As he approached, he surveyed us with a surly frown that changed slowly into a leering grin. He lurched over and placed a hand familiarly on my shoulder. "'We must part,' he announced dramatically. "'Ove, the best of friends, must part. Well, good-bye, little interfering tufel. Forgive you, though, because you're such a pretty little tufel. He raised one hand as though to pat my cheek, and because of the horror which I saw on the face of the woman beside me, I tried to smile, and did not shrink from him. But with a quick movement von Gerhard clutched the swaying figure and turned it so that it faced the stairs. "'Come, Nurlanger, 
Time for hard-working men like you and me to be in bed. Mrs. Orme must not nod over her desk tomorrow, either. So good night. Schlafen Sie wohl. Conrad Nurlanger turned a scowling face over his shoulder. Then he forgot what he was scowling for, and smiled a leering smile. Pretty good friends, you and the little Tufel, yes? Guess we'll have to watch you, huh, Anna? We'll watch him, won't we? He began to climb the stairs laboriously, with Frau Nurlanger's light figure flitting just ahead of him. At the bend in the stairway she turned and looked down on us a moment, her eyes very bright and big. She pressed her fingers to her lips and wafted a little kiss toward us with a gesture indescribably graceful and pathetic. She viewed her husband's laborious progress, not daring to offer help. Then the turn in the stair hid her from sight. In the dim quiet of the little hallway, von Gerhard held out his hands. Those deft, manual hands, those steady, sure, surgeonly hands, hands to cling to, to steady oneself by, and because I needed them most just then, and because I longed with my whole soul to place both my weary hands in those strong, capable ones, and to bring those dear, cool, sane fingers up to my burning cheeks, I put one foot on the first stair and held out two chilly fingertips. "'Good night, Herr Doctor,' I said, and thank you, not only for myself but for her. I have felt what she feels to-night. It is not a pleasant thing to be ashamed of one's husband.' Von Gerhard's two hands closed over that one of mine. "'Don, you will let me help you to find comfortable quarters. You cannot tramp about from place to place all the week. Let us get a list of addresses, and then, with the machine, we can drive from one to the other in an hour. It will at least save you time and strength.' "'Go boarding-house hunting in a stunning green automobile!' I exclaimed. From my vantage point on the steps I could look down on him and there came over me a great longing to run my fingers gently through that crisp blonde hair, and to bring his head down close against my breast for one exquisite moment. So. Landladies and automobiles, I laughed. Never. Don't you know that if they got one glimpse through the front parlor windows of me stepping grand-like out of your green motor-car, they would promptly overcharge me for any room in the house? I shall go room-hunting in my oldest hat, with one finger sticking out of my glove." Von Gerhard shrugged despairing shoulders. "'Na, nah, of what use it is to plead with you. Sometimes I wonder if, after all, you are not merely amusing yourself, getting copy, perhaps, for the book, or a new experience to add to your already varied store.' Abruptly I turned to hide my pain, and began to ascend the stairs. With a bound, Von Gerhard was beside me, his face drawn and contrite. "'Forgive me, Don. I know that you are wisest.' It is only that I become a little mad, I think, when I see you battling alone like this, among strangers, and know that I have not the right to help you. I knew not what I was saying. Come, raise your eyes and smile, like the little soldatin that you are. So. Now I am forgiven, yes? I smiled cheerily enough into his blue eyes. Quite forgiven. And now you must run along. This is scandalously late. The aborigines will be along saying Morgan instead of Nobbin if we stay here much longer. Good night. You will give me your new address as soon as you have found a satisfactory home? Never fear. I probably shall be pestering you with telephone calls, urging you to have pity upon me in my loneliness. Now good night again. I am as full of farewells as a Bernhardt. And to end it I ran up the stairs. At the bend, just where Frau Nurlanger had turned, I, too, stopped and looked over my shoulder. Von Gerhard was standing as I had left him, looking up at me, and like Frau Nurlanger, I wafted a little kiss in his direction before I allowed the bend in the stairs to cut off my view. But Von Gerhard did not signify by look or word that he had seen it, as he stood looking up at me, one strong white hand resting on the broad baluster. End of chapter 15